We're live on the air. Hank Strange, live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios in Gainesville, Florida. Put your big girl panties on, because tonight we have Dietrich, aka Skinny Medic, is in the building, <laughs> and we're gonna. We're, it's, this is gonna be fun. We're gonna talk about a lot of different stuff. Of course, his name is Skinny Medic, so we might be covering some medical stuff. But that's you know that's not the only thing we have to talk about, right? No, we can talk about a bunch of stuff, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at the medical side. Yeah, okay. You sound like you want us to stick to medical things. I was te I was teasing Dietrich off air because I was like, you know, let's get some like sex questions since you're in the medical field. You know, now you are a paramedic. Do you ever see sexual emergencies? Um, <laughs> I've seen some stuff. <laughs> um, I bet you have. <laughs> I've seen some obje objects that shouldn't be where certain <laughs> objects are supposed to go, and <laughs> really, um, I have. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing what rolls into the ER. Uh, people want to insert things in certain areas that just shouldn't be inserting. And how long? <laughs> this is like right now. Dietrich is like, man, why did I come on the air? Dude, I right? need a couple of beers for this chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just wondering, like, how long do people wait before they actually dial my mom one? Like, you know, I don't like. I don't know what goes through your mind when you realize that something bad is going on, and <laughs> you yeah, um, bad of a highly embarrassing nature. Yeah, you got to be really against the wall. Decide you're going to call an ambulance to for certain situations or even roll into the emergency room for certain situations. Yeah. I always, you know, I've seen it in movies, but I always wonder if it's true. Have you seen the dudes who took too much Viagra? You ever seen that? Those dudes? I have not seen that. I've heard nurses talk about it and doctors talk about it that, um, that, you know, they have the, was it like longer than four hours? I don't know what the commercial says, but um, they take syringes and they put it on either side of your penis. <laughs> well, and, wait a second. Either side. Yes. Yes, either side of it. So they take like saline on this side and they squirt it in and it draw it back out the other side. Oh, no, so like, that's... No, like I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, man. I, no, I, I thought, like I think in the movies they show that it's in one needle, but not two. <laughs> yeah, so in real life, it's two needles. They, do you do, do they knock the guy out? Because I would tell them, you need to put me under. I hope so. Jeez, I hope so. Yeah. Good gosh. I also, I wonder, like, how much is too much, you know? Like, how did uh, dudes get into a too much situation? I mean, like, you get in that situation, you're like, a week later, you're like, yeah, I'm going to take some more blue pills. It'll be fine. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never again. Okay, okay. Let's, you know, let's uh, get to, like, actual business here. Uh, first of all, tell us about yourself. Tell us who you are. What's, you know, we were talking a little bit about your day job. But how did you get started with YouTube and all that? So I uh, am a paramedic. I'm, I'm a paramedic here in South Carolina. I uh, was a full-time paramedic for 13 years. Um, my good buddy, Such, uh, does gun reviews as well, uh, just like you. Absolutely. Such and is a good dude. He's a real good dude. He actually kind of got me into it. You know, he was encouraging me to do a YouTube channel. There's not a whole lot of medical channels out there. Um, there's very few medical channels out there, so he kind of encouraged me. And then we figured out there was a market for first aid kits, uh, that, for affordable first aid kits and good quality first aid kits. You know, you can go to CVS and buy the kits that have like a thousand band-aids in them, but really at the end of the day, that's not going to do you a whole lot of good. So right. uh, Suits really encouraged me to do that. And with, through him, I really got involved in the gun community here on YouTube and they've been a huge support of my channel all over. Um, so just, it grew. And now we do it full time. Uh, my wife and I run medical gear outfitters full time. So we do custom first aid kits. We have kits now. We can do individual supplies. Okay, so you're also custom. Say it again. What was the? Medicalgearoutfitters.com. Yeah. And then medical we gear, do, okay. um, you know, we have kits that are pre made. That way, if you really are not 100% sure what you're looking for and you just want a good kit, you can go buy anything from like the small boo boo kits that have the five by nines, four by fours, all the way up to full trauma kits. And um, we build custom kits for individuals and companies too. You know, they may be looking for something particular that they have a idea in mind what they want to do with their kit. So we'll build it for them. Okay. Very cool. So um, where should people have these kits? Obviously, you know, you should probably have one on you. I'm, I'm going to assume that's going to be smaller, lightweight, where are the places you um, recommend that people keep the kits on them? So I like the smaller kits spread out. I mean, you can buy the big backpacks that are just, you know, four and $500 kits, but I like the smaller kits because typically like those people are going to run those, 
those tile backpacks in their vehicle. Well, if you have one in your vehicle and Lola's out somewhere else, and she may not have that kit with her. So to have smaller kits throughout your living space and where you, where you live is important. So to have a couple of things in your, your vehicle, if you have a shop at your uh, place and have, you know, if you're working with wood saws, things like that, then have a good tourniquet things, you know, a trauma kit near your workshop. If you mm -hmm. have a range on your property like you do, uh, then having a good trauma kit close by your, where you're shooting firearms is extremely important. Right. Um, you know, and so you're going to have a home kit that's going to have bigger items in it. You know, you, you can do that. You have the space. So, but when you have your vehicle, you're going to run smaller things. You're only going to probably keep a few Tylenol and a few Benadryl, things like that. And then at your range, you need a good tourniquet, uh, and you need a good pressure bandage. You need a good chest seal, some galls for stop major bleeding. Uh, if something bad happens and you uh, hit your femoral artery in your leg with a with a firearm, you, know, you shoot yourself accidentally, or someone mm -hmm. shoots you accidentally, you can bleed out in three minutes, completely lose your whole blood volume in three minutes. So you have to be able to stop the bleeding quickly and be good at it, be be proficient at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of these days I need to get you to come out to the hacienda and take a look at uh, what we what we've got going on over there. Cause I'm sure it's in, not in the proper shape that it's supposed to be in. I know. I would love to come down there. I, I see, I, I've watched your video, see the ambulance down there. Like you got, I'm like, I want to go play with that thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just an ambulance body. People always asking me about it. It's just the body, but we do keep stuff in there. We do keep like uh, emergency kits and all that kind of stuff that we would need out there, but I'm pretty sure that we're not really up to snuff. So it'd be nice to get you to come out, check it out. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and for folks out there that, um, that want to know, I'm sure you've got lots of different videos on the channel, right? We do. We have about 500 uh, videos now on my YouTube channel. So we do, the majority of our focus is the medical trauma side, but we'll branch out and do, because my slogan is you never know when you'll be the first responder. So right. I'm going to include firearms and in that thing. I'm going to include things, you know, like flashlights because Nobody typically wrecks on the side of the road when it's 75 degrees outside. It's usually pouring down rain at midnight when someone's going to wreck. Mm -hmm. So having flashlight is something that's important. Um, things like that. So we kind of branch out. And, you know, I've, you know, even though we're not a, a gun channel per se, we still do gun reviews and we, the channel has been accepted into the gun communities. These, these, we'll call them gun guys have said, maybe I do need a first aid kit. I do need to get some training. So it's been really cool to be accepted by the YouTube community in that aspect. Right. And you are a gun guy, right? Yes, absolutely. I shoot yeah. once a week. Right. Um, so uh, if I don't have my EMS uniform on, I have a gun on me. Um, and I shoot at the range about once a week. Uh, Such and I get together, like I said, about once a week. If I'm shooting other friends, it's twice a week. Um, we just bought some property. Uh, so hopefully going to be putting a range in on my property. Sweet. So, yeah, I shoot. I love to shoot. Now, am I a gun expert? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who wouldn't who wouldn't want to go shooting with Such Zero Zero <laughs> like once a week? <laughs> There's dudes out there that would probably pay for that. <laughs> it's funny, like, because I, I do trauma classes here in Greenville, mm -hmm. South Carolina. And so Such doesn't live very far from us. And we'll be doing a trauma class on a Saturday. And mm -hmm. Such will stop in for lunch and, like, just walk in. And these guys are, like, just that just shit stops. crazy like what <laughs> he just stops the place and i'm like dude you just shut down my class i appreciate it <laughs> yeah you know what i've seen happen with him that's funny like sometimes people don't see him i've been at shows and then they hear him talk because his voice is like a radio voice right mm -hmm. i don't know I, was he ever on the radio i don't think so no because he has like a really cool i'm not trying to say he's not a an unattractive dude because he's not he's a good looking guy but he's got a, a cool uh he's got a really cool radio voice and i've seen people hear him talking like wait a second <laughs> so yeah it's cool so has um have you ever had to save Suchis butt out there on the range i have not I okay have not. good good okay he's being safe yeah he is being safe and it's fun they all like the famous little video where he shot his hood up i wasn't even there and i'm like man i wish i'd have been there that would have been great <laughs> so what about Rodney? Is how often is Rodney out there? Um, Rodney comes every so often. He was actually harassing me just now, so he likes to harass us. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> yeah, Rodney's a good dude. Um, yeah, he he lives up in North Carolina, so he comes down a good bit and just kind of shows up when he wants to. Oh, he does. Okay, see, yeah, he's got it good. Okay, so um, here's we've got some questions coming in already. What do you see as the most common emergency? 
I'm guessing this is in the day job that people are, are asking In the about. day job, it is medical. I mean, a lot of people in the, on the, my day job it is, you know, people having chest pain, trouble breathing, things like that. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I don't put a tourniquet on every day of the week. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that would be bad if I did. Uh, it would be a cool job if I did that, but I, I don't do it. So um, the, the most thing we run into is, is, is you know, chest pain, trouble breathing, where, you know, people, um, unfortunately, or maybe, you know, older, elderly patients like that just are start having yeah. chest pain or medical stuff. Yeah, you're not really like in a gang zone or anything like that. No, I'm just, not. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. would be a cool job if I got to put a tourniquet on once a day. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, do some cool stuff like that. You know, but maybe, I don't. Maybe, maybe, but maybe you'd want to be able to carry with you because I'm assuming that um, it's against uh, policy for you to actually carry while you're on the job. It is. Right? It is against policy to carry on the job. Um, so, and I see both sides of that. I really do because I'm a gun guy. I carry it all the time. But in the back of a square ambulance, that's a really tight quarters. And if I'm carrying concealed and the guy attacks me, I'm not fast enough to draw my gun and get it out. And I have enough going on to have to worry about worrying about a firearm on the ambulance. So I get it. Like I see both sides. Like I don't think they should have to restrict me, but at the same time, I see the dangers in it. And I, I see people um, that my mind is trying to filter all the things I need to take care of this patient. I don't need to worry about a firearm on that side. I'll let law enforcement do that. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's so many things going on here. Anything could happen, so, But, you know. I mean, they're attacking first responders, so, you know, we're yeah. wearing body armor now. Um, I carry, I put okay. body armor on. You are? On. Yes, when I get on the ambulance, um, I, I carry body armor with me. Um, so what I, kind of incidents of first responders being attacked have you guys, because you said you're in South Carolina, right? I am. Um, several years ago, uh, we actually got pinned down in a house. Um, it was right after Ferguson happened. And um, I remember, and um, we, we were in the back house, and uh, the family was very happy that, that I'd said this, this lady wasn't going to live. And they got very upset and started fighting the police officers and things like that. And so oh, wow. we were actually pinned down the house. Um, I've, I've wrestled with a guy uh, who attacks me. He, um, I come around the corner. I was having the big EMS backpack on. Um, he speared me to the ground, and we fought for seven and a half minutes before I could get back up to me. Wow. Okay. So are you allowed to carry a knife at least or some? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm allowed to carry a knife. Okay. Are you allowed to use it against someone? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Absolutely. If it came down okay. to, to they were, I thought my life was in danger, I would. And that, it goes back to, I'd rather be tried in court. I would go, to, I would just go to, go to court over that. And you know, if I had to, but I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to go home to my kids and my wife at the end of the day. Absolutely, man. That's what we want. You, you know, that's what we want you to do. Um, so are there any, is there anything else that you guys can carry? Like maybe stun gun, pepper spray, anything? Not right now. I mean, there's talk about people carrying tasers, things like that. Um, but ultimately, you know, EMS is not, we're, we're disarmed. So we have to depend a lot on law enforcement um, to, to help us. And here in, in South Carolina, we have a, at least my department that we work for, we have a great relationship with the, the police department. So they're there and um, we, we, they're, they've saved my butts plenty of time. Okay, cool. Uh, um, so someone wants to know if the body armor is provided by the hospital and, and uh, what kind of body armor is it that you use? So the department I work for is just now starting to get uh, issued and they're actually just running steel plates. They're running AR-500 plates because they don't expire. It, it's a money issue. Wow. Okay. So that's going to add like a lot of, uh, a lot of weight to the gear. 12 and a half pounds. So yeah. we don't wear them all the time too. So we're just wearing them on certain calls that have a high risk. You know, uh, you've got a fight in progress. We're staging for 12 a or 12 staging for the police department. There's a gunshot, there's a stabbing, things like that. Now me personally, I have the, uh, um, not the elite. Um, it's the one that folds up into a briefcase. I just left the name of it. Elsa, mm -hmm. the Elsa kit. It folds up like a briefcase, so when I put it somewhere, it just looks like a laptop case, but then I unzip oh, okay. it, and it's a full plate carrier, and I run the DKX plates in mine. Now, those are light. Those are a couple pounds a piece, and they're level 3A body armor, So, um, but I like that uh, uh, Elsa kit because it doesn't look like a body armor until I unfold it, and then it's there, so it doesn't kind of, if a patient sees it just sitting on the ambulance, they don't freak out that I have a vest on the, on the ambulance. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. So it's there when you need to use it. Okay, and then I have a comment from the Tyvon show that says med kits should have two small bottles of vodka. <laughs> so that's funny. Is April Fool's this year, I did a video, and it's still like one of my most popular videos. I did an April Fool's mm -hmm. joke, 
uh, and said like the ultimate trauma kit. And in there, I had a bottle of Jack Daniels. Okay. <laughs> and it's still like I never took it down, and people get tore out of the frame because they watch it like because they don't realize it's not. Yeah, it's April Fool. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, this guy got me again." <laughs> so yeah, bottle of Jack Daniels in every first aid kit, you'd be good to go. Yeah, and and you know there might be some like actual realistic uses for that, you know. Yeah, it's sedative. I mean, yeah, if you're yeah. nervous, you take a swig, give some to the patient, be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so it's not really that bad. It's not that bad. So, okay, cool. You know what? Um, let's, uh, you know, I know that in the news, there's there's a couple of medical related things. So I want to hit that early while we're waiting for, for folks to hit us up with questions. If you guys out there have any questions for Skinny Medic, you know, let us know what they are. Um, of whatever nature, like I said before, we will answer it. So did you see this in the news? There was an Indiana police lieutenant that was shot dead while helping at a crash scene. You know, we were just talking about I this. Did. But this is not a situation that he expected this to happen, obviously. No, he was absolutely he was blindsided by this. Um, yes. And even mm -hmm. the, the female officer in New York City, uh, I think last month, who got shot while sitting, sitting in her patrol car, I mean, she got blindsided, and so did this officer. Just get totally blindsided by someone who and draws a gun on him. Yeah, because I think what happened here was, uh, let me read the article. This particular one I'm reading is on uh, ABC News. It says an Indiana police lieutenant was shot and killed while trying to help at the scene of a car crash on Thursday, authorities said. Um, he basically, uh, let me see, uh, Aaron Allen of the police department in Southport, just outside of Indianapolis, was the department's first line of duty death. Wow. So the shooting happened Thursday about 2.30 when Allen uh, and, and an officer from the Homecroft police responded to report of a crash. Uh, as he appro approached the vehicle, the inverted vehicle, as he, so the vehicle was flipped over and, sh and the, the people inside were firing shots as they were walking up to it. So that's, that's crazy. I don't even know why they would be doing that. Um, so he was 38, husband, father, he was hospitalized and then later died. Obviously they returned uh, fire and I think that uh, the people inside the vehicle were, were wounded. But you know, that's, um, that's just something you don't expect, right? You're walking up to a vehicle that's flipped over. No, it just, you have your guard down. Um, you know, the, the instance when I said where I got into a fight with a patient who tackled me, my guard was completely down. Um, I didn't, wasn't anticipating going into that situation. And so every, it seems like every single time I've been into a fight uh, with a patient or you know, something like that and on my job, there was always little clues that you look back and you're like, man, I screwed up. And it's not something like the big thing glaring at you says you're getting ready to go into a fight. Mm -hmm. You walk up to a house and the front door's busted open. You're like, that's not normal. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we, when I teach uh, EMT class, I tell these, you know, one of the things we first talk about is the scene safe BSI. So it's a scene safe. You have your gloves on. You have your – we, we, we talk about that and it's just something they say, but in real life, it's something that you always have to think about and you always have to change. It's in the world we live in now. Um, it's more publicized things, you know, active shooters, active assailants, things like that. Um, it's there. So our first responders are having to wear body armor and things like that. And it's, it's sad that firefighters are getting shot at yeah. responding to wrecks and fires and, you know, police officers put their lives on the line and to, to protect us. Yeah, I don't know why someone would do that. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows? I'm sure maybe as time goes on here, we'll find out. I don't know if maybe the reason why they were in the accident had something to do with like, uh, you know, a drive by or something. So maybe they thought they were in trouble or maybe they had something in there that they weren't supposed to have. But I think the fact that you're flipped over trumps everything. <laughs> something you know? bad happened to get you that situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What kind of training do they give you guys for these these sort of things. Do they do any kind of training for this? Like if you get into a fight or if you get into in the middle of a firefight going on? Not, not a whole lot of fight. Um, not a whole lot of class. And you're starting to see more and more, especially these active assailants uh, coming on and getting more public publicized. We're doing more training, things like that, getting EMS into these scenes a lot faster. You know, that's something we struggled with in years past with these school shootings is getting EMS, getting patient care in there a lot faster. So, there is training now across the U.S. going a lot faster to get EMS into these scenes, uh, movie theaters, uh, hotel, you know, things like uh, school shootings like that, getting EMS in there faster to provide care. And, 
you know, that's one of the reasons why we do our video is because it does take EMS in a, a while to get to these things. So if you find yourself, you work a nine to five office job and some dude comes in there because he's ticked off and he starts shooting the place up, you're mm -hmm. going to be on your own for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to stop the bleeding for yourself, stop the bleeding for your coworkers and be able to make tourniquets, improvise medicine, things like that. So that's one of the main reasons why we do our, our channel is for that particular reason. Yeah. So if you don't have a kit, what's the easiest way for you to create a tourniquet? So let's say someone is out on the range or any place and they get a gunshot wound. What's the easiest way for them to make shift a tourniquet? Or is that a good idea? While you have, you know, a, I like a good commercial tourniquet, but if you don't have a good, you know, like a cat tourniquet or soft T or something like that, uh, you're going to have to make one. So the 550 cord's always way here, and it is just too narrow. The 550 cord just cuts into the muscle, doesn't do it. Uh, a belt can work. Um, it's not the best. You know, if you can create a windlass, meaning that you have something you can spin to tighten it, that's better. So using a T-shirt, a blanket, and using a stick or some kind of like a screwdriver, so you can tie a knot on and rotate it to create that windlass effect to help tighten it. Okay. That's that's what you know to get it because and else you just have a good pressure bandage so you've got to get something that that spins to create that pressure and that will cut the pulse off and stop the bleeding you know it's interesting that at the boston city marathon there was no commercial tourniquets used you know post bombing so those individuals who received they all received improvised tourniquets and then when they got to the hospital the doctors realized that that they weren't actually real tourniquets but they slowed the bleeding down enough for these patients to get to the hospital so Every person who had an improvised tourniquet who made it to the hospital all survived. So right. these patients would not have survived if they had not had some sort of improvised tourniquet on. And those were all improvised, you know, t-shirts, blankets. Okay. So the best so the best thing to do if you have a t-shirt on, take that t-shirt, like rip it up and make it into something that you could wrap around your leg or your arm and then put what? Like maybe a tree branch or something in there something and just strong. twist it. Yeah, something strong, you know, like a screwdriver, something uh Something you can get some leverage on. So if you'll wrap it around your leg, tie a knot, like an overhand knot, and then put it down into the knot and tie another overhand knot, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then you can spin it and rotate it. And that will that will work. You know, it's not obviously if I had my choice, I'd put a you know a, a real a real tourniquet on you. Like I would put like I just did a review on the uh, Sam tourniquet that's out right now. So this mm -hmm. has, is a windless tourniquet here. So this is what we would spin to stop the blood flow here. Okay. So this is something that, you know, is what I would recommend someone, you know, these tourniquets are expensive, unfortunately. Um, you know, to get a good tourniquet, you're going to spend about $30. But I always tell, you know, these gun guys, you know, I was like, that's a couple of P mags. So just skip out. Yeah, that's like a box of ammo or something. You know? Yeah. Just skip out. You know, I like the. What, what's a, what should the average price of something like this be? 30 bucks or. Yeah, you're going to look about $30. Like, this is the cat tourniquet here. This is the one that I run personally in my gear. Um, I think it's just easier to operate. So the problem with these, though, is there's counterfeits on the market. Okay. And so they're fakes. What happened was that the uh, airsoft community was were putting these on their gear because in the game, they could reset. They could save themselves. You know, if they get hit with an airsoft bullet, they could put a tourniquet back oh, on. Oh, Okay. So these were on the market for like $5 and people started buying them up very quickly, but they, they break the windlass right here. It it's very flexible. And so I've had some of them that you can almost make a U shape out of the windlass here when you bend it. Mm -hmm. So people started buying that and they're all over Amazon, eBay, things like that. So just be cautious if you go to find these that. So is there a good, is there a good brand name that we, that we know would be genuine or how to like, how do we tell that we're getting a fake one versus the real? So I, I'm a distributor from North American Rescue, who's the main distributor here in, or the only distributor for the U.S. market. So that's you've got to make sure it's made by North American Rescue. There's other people like I know there's on Amazon that are making uh, knockoffs that want to have thumb holes and things like that, and they're breaking. Um, I've broke them yeah. in class for my students to show okay. them. Okay. So. I mean, folks can just go directly to you, right? I mean, you, yeah, you, absolutely. Your that's where you can. Yeah. Yeah, you've got shop. you've got good prices and everything on your site, right? Yes, sir. We we are competitive with Amazon, you know, for our medical supplies, and you know we're not trying to we're make, making stuff affordable. So this cat tourniquet on my website is uh, twenty nine ninety nine. It's got free shipping, 
and I'll ship it right to you here in the U.S. Yeah, just hit the hit us up with the website again. I'm going to try to get Lola, if you can hear me, to uh, put a link to the website in this video. If we don't do it right now, we'll we'll do it pretty soon. What's the website again? It's shop dot skinnymedic dot com. Yeah, shop dot skinnymedic dot com. And um, I see in the uh, chat someone said that they've used a uh, seatbelt out of a car. Have you? I'm sure you've seen that. The wider the tourniquet, the wider you can make that bend, the easier it is to get blood flow off, cut off. So if you're using a t-shirt, using some kind of you know improvised, the wider you can make it, the better it is. Okay. Is there a way for someone to make do-it-yourself kits or you just don't write? I mean, that's probably just not, I mean, I think at 30 bucks that might not be affordable. Or what do you think? Have you ever looked into those where people are like, well, you know, I want to do it on a budget, so I'm just going to make everything for my kit from, from other found things like that. Yeah, I mean, you can do it. I mean, we, you know, we've got like the SWAT T tourniquet. Uh, it's affordable. It's about a $15 tourniquet. So we've, we put like an, if you go on my website, the shop.skinnymedic.com, we did an EDC trauma kit. So the very basic one of those is $25. So, the, and it comes with a pressure bandage, you got gauze and you get a SWAT T tourniquet. So um, my little boy just yeah, that's cool. Sure. Yeah, I saw him there for a quick second. <laughs> go. Um, yeah, that's cool. Not a problem. And absolutely, people will, sometimes they do want to put together their own first aid kits. They have some training and they have an idea of what they want to do. So we recommend that. If you want to do it, then absolutely. But some people don't. They just like, you know what? I, I trust you. You've got the knowledge and we want to buy one of your kits. And they'll do that. So um, some people yeah. do. They, they, they want to build it. And that's absolutely, they can do it. And they can do it from our website as well. Right. So is So if you just have the kit, Let's say you buy a kit and you just have it, but you don't get any training. Is that useful to just have the kit? I know, I know the training would be better, but I'm just, yeah. you know, so, I'm just curious there. You know, I, I at the end of my videos, I say you never know when you'll be the first responder. You need the right gear and the right training. So I do feel like it's a kind of it's a good. You got to have the mixture because it does me no good to have a two hundred dollar first aid kit and I don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that knowledge is key, knowing how to make a tourniquet. How do I make a chest seal? You know, if someone gets shot in the chest, you know, we have to seal that up. We put mm -hmm. a plastic bag over it so air goes in our throat instead of out our chest right here. So knowing how to make a chest seal, if we don't have one, you know, that knowledge is key. Right. Okay. But if you've got, if you have something there and you don't know, but maybe someone else does, that's the only situation that that would be helpful? Yeah, and I get that, uh, you know, guys all the time will say, I don't know how to um, use, I'm trying to think of something, um, you know, I, I'm scared to put a tourniquet on, but I have it just in case you show up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things people carry uh, needles, pleural decompression needles. I see that because you can buy them in your surplus kit. It's a needle that goes in your chest. So it relieves the pressure in your, like if blood builds up or air builds up, you put a needle in here. Okay. Now, if the average Joe does that, they're going to get in trouble. Um, okay. But people carrying the kits, they're like, well, I never know if a paramedic is going to show up or a doctor is going to show up on the side of the road. So mm -hmm. they'll they'll carry up things like that. Right. But the best thing, you know, the best thing is to get the training, right? Absolutely. Go talk to your local, you know, if you, I would tell you if you can come to Greenville, South Carolina through my class, I would love to have you. Um, but there's trauma classes all across the U.S. Um, you know, there's several that you know you go to your local gun range go to your local gun store and tell them you want a trauma class and they will probably be able to point you to somewhere that you yeah. can go and, and learn how to put on tourniquets how to stop bleeding things like that yeah so how do we approach this like so how do we know what's a good class to take how do we know what's a decent price to pay all that you know are there resources out there are there people that give it, like free introductory classes i'm just trying to figure it out because you know as gun guys one of the things that, we, that you find out if you've been doing this long enough that a lot of us me included we spend money on the guns the ammo lots of other things you know and we don't spend the money on things like having the kits and we don't spend money on training either right um you know, I don't, I don't, I can't think of a resource. I know that's bad, but maybe there's, maybe there's a need for that. I can't think of a resource. You know, I can think of, um, I know like, like right off of my head, there's a, um, uh, there's a place in Alabama that's doing stuff. I, he's in Troy, Alabama. Uh, I can't remember the name of his company. Um, I know, uh, God, I can't think of his company's names, but I'm having a brain fart. Uh, Spent Brass is in, California. Uh, he's a good dude. I met him just a while ago. He's doing classes. Um, Sean at We Like Shooting is doing classes as well. 
Oh, okay. Um, so I, I just maybe there there's a need for that for you know just a somewhere to go to to find these classes. Um, but you know if you can't go to your, your local gun shop or gun range, go to your local tech school. You know someone that's teaching paramedic classes, teaching nursing classes, and they may have a resource to you they can point you to uh, to find a good class. Yeah, I mean it, we you know there probably should be a better way, and then. I guess you can also just turn to YouTube and there's some videos on there that will at least give you some basic stuff. I don't know what you think about that. Do the videos really show people what they need to know? Is it valuable? I, so. I hope my videos do. I mean, that's what, you know, we, we do videos like that. You know, I've done videos on how to, how to treat a gunshot wound, how to treat a knife wound, mm -hmm. um, you know, how to treat, you know, a chest injury, things like that. So, um, I hope my videos do that. Now, uh, is hands-on practice better? Yes. But if someone has five or ten minutes to watch one of my videos, I hope that's helping. Um, I get emails a lot where people said that, you know, they watched my stroke video. And then uh, a week later, their relative had a stroke. And they knew they were having a stroke because they watched my video. So that's, yeah. that's cool. It's good to at least have something in the back of your mind, right? Then right. nothing. And so that's yeah, what we do. go into panic on. mode. You know, at least you can identify the situation that you're in. Right, and that's why we on my channel, we like the cat tourniquet is here. So this is a $30 tourniquet. So someone may not want to open it up and use it. So I will. Like I will open this up and show you exactly how to use it, what to look for, um, some, some of the negative things of the tourniquet, things like that. You know, like the chest seals. I, those are expensive. You know, they're 15, 20 bucks for chest seals. So I will open them up on my channel, show you what they look like, show you how to use them. Things like that. You know, the pressure once base. you open it, that's it, right? No good. Yeah, I mean, it starts degrading and going down. So people don't want to open it up, and I get it. Um, like the Israeli bandage is a very popular pressure bandage. So I will open that bandage up on my channel and show you how to use it and show you some you know, thought behind it. That way you don't have to open yours up. You can leave it in your first aid kit. Yeah, absolutely. So at least, guys, start from looking at videos. Skinnymatic has tons of them. I think you said like 500. <laughs> Yeah. I think so. I think we're like 500 videos now. Yeah, you've been doing this for years, man. Um, I think we've we've probably been doing this at least. Um, I don't know if I asked you how many years at the beginning, but I know I've been. I'm approaching five years. I don't know how long. I've got to be. I'm trying to think. Um, it seems like you're at least that, if not longer, than I've been doing it. So I've probably been doing about that not longer. Now I kind of I've had two periods in my YouTube career where I was just totally slacker and died off. Um, and just kind of didn't do anything for job reasons. Um, yeah, because you were busy. Yeah, and I think you, you recently, like, what was it, like a year ago or something, you just ramped up? Yep, so a year and a half ago, um, I stepped away from EMS full-time, so I still work on the ambulance, you know, a few times a month, uh, but this is my full-time career now. YouTube, uh, Medical Gear, Outfitters is my full-time job, so the last two years, we've really ramped up the videos, where we're doing one to two videos a week yeah. uh, right now, and so, uh, you know, really gotten serious about it, but and we've seen, you know, the numbers increase and things uh, on the YouTube. And yeah, so that's good. I mean, that right there is a great resource. Um, I don't know how you have stuff laid out on your channel. I don't know if you've got like, soup, like a super emergency playlist, so that if someone's really in trouble, they have no clue. They could just go to Skinny Medic, bam, hit this video up and look at it right now. Yeah, we've got them kind of put apart. Like we've got like the tourniquet videos, the chest seal videos. We've got medical videos, and that's not people. Like, you know, they, they like the cool trauma stuff, but they also want to know, like the stroke video, like they want to know how to spot a stroke, you know, what to do if someone's having chest pain. So they want to know those medical side too, you know, that's, I mean, when we're trying to reach out and do those videos yeah. too. Right. And I've got a question here. Do you recommend CPR training? Absolutely. Um, that, you're more likely to save a life doing that than ever putting a tourniquet on. Um, you know, with someone who's in cardiac arrest, I mean, their heart is not beating at all their chances of survivability go down by 10% for every minute that someone's not doing CPR. So for, you know, if it takes EMS eight minutes to get to you, they, that your loved one already has a very slim chance of getting their pulse back. So absolutely. You can go to your local Red Cross, uh, find yeah. someone of American Heart Association. I think a lot of schools have it. I know back when I was in high school, there's a lot of schools and places like that that have those classes, right? Yeah, we teach it at high schools here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I teach it to seniors. So we teach them how to do CPR on adults, how to do infants, and then we talk to them about how to put a tourniquet on, how to make a tourniquet, and kind of how to stop the bleeding. Yeah. What about the um, – what's the machines? Um, uh, what is it? Is it the a, ADs? Yeah. Like uh, is that a defibrillator? 
It is. So it's yeah. external uh, automatic defibrillator. Um, yeah. And so those are getting more and more popular because the price is coming down. Those were when they first came out like anything else, they're super expensive. But now they're finding that they're at baseball fields, they're at movie mm-hmm. theaters. So uh, learning how to use those is, is easy, but you know, it just takes some training. Yeah. What's a good price on those? On the class or an AD? On the AD. They're about $400, $500. Okay. Yeah. So for churches, things like that, they'll, they'll have them. Um, your community buildings, you know, a lot of times uh, your office complex may have one close by, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if they do, they probably do something to get some training going on there. Absolutely. Or there's someone that's trained. So I know we kind of covered this in the beginning, but there's probably folks coming in, so we should probably just circle back to it a little bit. What's a good starter kit? Um, you know, what should be in the car, at home, in the range bag, etc. So in your car, um, I like to have some medicine in there, obviously. Uh, so like to- Tylenol, aspirin, um, Benadryl. Um, I like keeping the liquid Benadryl in my kits because it works faster. Um, so you get the kids Benadryl, um, that's going to work faster. And then having some bandaging supplies, you know, some five by nines, four by fours. And then I like having like a commercial splint, such as like the Sam splint or a lunum splint. So a fracture, someone breaks their arm, breaks their leg, you can start splitting it for them. And um, I'm trying to think what else to have in your vehicle. Do you guys, um, so you guys sell a car kit, don't you? We do. We, okay. we, I have a yeah. car kit that we sell. Okay. And then you, know, you put some ice packs in there. Just with the heat, um, you know, we're not far from South Carolina here. You're down in Florida. So check mm-hmm. your gear, uh, you know, twice a year. I say when the, when the time changes, you should probably check your gear. Okay. Uh, to make sure that it's still good, the heat hasn't gotten to it. Uh, and the how, medicine how can, still you, in- how can you tell? So a lot of these things come vacuum sealed. And if it loses its vacuum, it's, it's no good. Okay. Um, if you've got like the betadine wipes or the alcohol wipes to clean a wound, just open one up. And if it's dry, then I would throw the rest of them away and get some new stuff in your car kit. If you open one up and it's still wet, still looks good, then the rest of them should be good. And then for your range, uh, I, I think you need a tourniquet. We kind of talked about that a few minutes ago. I think you need a good tourniquet. You need a good pressure bandage and you need some gauze um, and you need some chest seals. So. Just stay away from the tampon. Don't put a tampon in your trauma kit. Um, there's not. <laughs> yeah, doesn't I really mean, that's kind of is that what is that a wife's tale? Because I see it in a lot of movies. And... It's a lot. It's <laughs> yeah. out there. Um, people say they have tampons, and I did a video on my channel about how much gauze is actually not in a tampon. Uh, mm. you know, you, so you just need some good gauze to control bleeding, things like that. Okay, you don't necessarily. So is the tamp? Is the tampon totally useless? It's not totally useless. I mean, you've got like I know I've used it on a, for a nosebleed. Um, I've seen people use it for nose, uh, stick it to a nose, it's bleeding, you can't get it to stop. Stick one mm-hmm. up in there, they're good for that. Um, you can start a fire with it, uh, kind of like <laughs> that. So, um, but, you know, That's interesting. <laughs> gauze is good. You know, just plenty of good 5 by 9s 4 by 4s can go a long way. Okay, cool. And then what's good to have in the home, in the home kit? So I like having bigger items because if you buy stuff by bulk, you can get, you know, better price on it. So buying box of 5 by 9s 4 by 4s having more medicine like in acids, um, you know, just good general uh, medicines. I get the generic medications. So if you buy medications that are name brand, like you buy the Tylenol name brand, it's really expensive. But if you get the CVS or Walgreens uh, version of Tylenol, it's a lot cheaper. And you can buy it by the bottle and, you know, buy it by the big bottle and split it up in little smaller places. Right. So um, here, uh, Boss Hogg in the comments had a good question. He said, how often should you retrain for, for CPR? So at least every two years, I think, I think that's a good time frame. And things change. Uh, every couple of years, they're doing research, they're doing data, and they're finding out that what we're doing may or may not work. And then some things work better. Sorry, my little girl's walking through. <laughs> um, okay, that's cool. So... Um, you know, that so, makes sense, man. I think the last time I did one was like uh, the 90s. Yeah, so things have definitely so, changed since then. Yeah. Uh, like one of the things that changed now is if I teach the uh, an average Joe how to do CPR, we don't do mouth-to-mouth anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm not doing mouth-to-mouth to anybody in cardiac arrest. It's gross. It's nasty. So I'm just going to do chest compressions. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of data research out there that supports that, that you can just do chest compressions and make a huge difference in saving someone's life. Okay. And I'm sure you have some CPR videos. I do. Yep. I do. I have yeah. CPR videos on 
Um, oh, hey. Oh, she's really cute. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, she looks like her mom, thank gosh. She, she's, yeah, she's obviously not shy. <laughs> no, she's not. Because your son, he just came in, snuck in, went out. <laughs> yes, my little girl is not shy. She will, yeah. if she sees you at the NRA show or something like that, she's going to give you a hug. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter if she knows you or not knows you. doesn't know yeah. you. You've got nice kids. I remember when you did that video where you tested your kids to see if they would mess with your guns. Remember that? I what, do. What was that, man? Was that, that has God. to be, wow, that's probably years ago. That's been a few years ago. Yeah. I saw a show, an episode on Dateline. I was like, I was working EMS. It was like two o'clock in the morning. Saw a rerun of Dateline show and I'm like, I'm going to try that on my kids. So I came home, told the wife we're going to run this experiment. So I had like a little camcorder I set up on the shelf and just laid it out. And, um, man, that's been a really popular video. And Yeah, I think uh, it's it a great good. idea. And we, we did that with our kids as well. We put snap caps in there. We had the conversation with them. You know, we teach them about guns and gun safety mm -hmm. and all that. But I always teach them, you find a gun. If I leave something around here, you find it. You don't touch it. You come to me. You chastise me for leaving it there or whatever, but you don't mess with it. And then we're like, well, let's see if they actually do that. And we left it out. And they did exactly that. They didn't mess with it. Yeah, same thing. I mean, I, I absolutely, I, I try to keep my guns in a safe area, you know, out of, if, you know, in the safe, up on objects, hidden objects. Like that right there is a tactical walls chalkboard that there's a Glock 43 behind. Cool. Um, Very cool. So things like that. So we do... But, you know, if I'm cleaning a firearm, you know, you may leave it out, you know, things like yeah. that. So, um, and it happens. Uh, it happened to me just a few weeks ago. And I had, we were shooting ground squirrels out in the, the backyard. And my gun was emptied. I'd already checked it. It was the Mark IV, Ruger Mark IV. I'd already, it was empty. It was laying there. Mm -hmm. And my little girl found it. And she just reamed me out. Like, just, God left the gun laying there. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, sorry. But she didn't touch it. Yeah, there, that's good. Was, you know, a few weeks ago, she didn't touch it. She just came and got me. It's like, Dad, you left the gun out. I was like, Oh yeah, I did. You know, and went out there and got it, and it was you know, no way had touched it, no way moved it. So that's why having the education, you know, that they're not, they're not, you know, there's no curiosity there. You know, my little boy yeah. shoots. Uh, we haven't taken my little girl yet to shoot, but my little boy shoots. He he likes his uh, shooting the, the twenty two. So um, yeah. It's, I think it's a absolutely, I think people should do that, have those kinds of conversation with their kids. There's no way of stopping your kids, you know, in the world that we live in from coming across these things. You don't want to create fear. You want, you want them to have knowledge of what to do if they ever come across that. And the number one thing is don't touch it. You know, don't let absolutely. people point stuff at them. You know, like if their friends, you know, their friends might find something and they're trying to point it at them and they need to be able to like, you know, get out of that situation you know, and avoid those things. So, um, and I've done that to my nieces and nephews. Now I've got nieces and nephews and their parents are not into guns. Um, and so I've showed them, you know, they, you know, there, there's a firearm in my truck and I, you know, I don't, I don't want them messing with it. So you know, my little nephews, I've nieces, I've showed them like, Hey, this is what my gun looks like. You want to hold it? And just to show them. So they're not curious that way if they are, you know, something happens and there's no curiosity there. Yeah, and, and if they have to, this is not like the first thing they should do, but I've showed my kids how to make something safe if they, if, you know, they feel like they have to do that. You know? That's a good idea. Yeah, so um, let me just hit up a couple of things here. Uh, Jim Lewis says, buy a face shield, face shield. Blood without oxygen is useless. So, and he is correct, but, and there's a lot of research and data going in that this is for the first 10 minutes that someone is in cardiac arrest, that there's still oxygen attached to the red blood cells. So for the first 10 minutes of that arrest, it's super important to keep it going round and round because it's just sitting in our brain, sitting in our heart, not going anywhere. So for the first 10 minutes, absolutely, you know, doing chest compressions is the number one key. Um, having a good face shield, yes, is important. For someone who's choking or has drowned, then mouth to mouth is, you know, important for them because the reason why they're in cardiac arrest is because of respiratory problems. So if we can fix that, we can probably get them back. Um, but the average person, I'm not going to do mouth to mouth to because one of the things I do not tell you in CPR class is that these guys and women, they vomit, you know, because their mm. muscles are relaxed. So if their stomach is full of pizza and beer and whatever else that's coming oh back up. Yeah. And so I'm not putting my mouth to that. So I will do no. chest compressions all day long, but I'm not doing mouth to yeah. unless you're my unless you're my babies. Yes. <laughs> you know, or, or or my wife or something like that. Yeah, it's uh 
Okay, cool. So what does a what should a face uh, shield cost? So there's a couple of different options you have for face shields. Um, you can have just a simple keychain one that goes in your keychain. That's a plastic shield. It's real flimsy and goes over to one way valve that goes here. That way, if I do throw up, uh, you know, the rescuer doesn't get vomit in their mouth. Um, those are probably you know four or five dollars, things like that. Uh, you can get the ones that have a hard plastic piece here, and those are much better. Now they take up a little bit more room, but they're better because then there's a seal that comes right around through here. Mm -hmm. And that way, if the patient does throw up, then it's in a seal, and you kind of limits the protector of the rest the rescuer from getting vomit in their mouth. Okay, cool. Because I'm a sympathetic puker. If someone pukes, oh, really? I'm going to puke. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. <laughs> That's And you know, a lot of people are, man. I remember there was a call where we had just ate like, I swear I ate like three or four hot dogs. And we went to a call and this lady was puking and it smelled awful. And I had to get out of the ambulance because I thought I was going to lose it right how, there on the side of the... <laughs> how the hell do you stay skinny as a skinny <sighs> medic and you're eating four hot dogs? I, I like to run. I, I still run a good bit. <laughs> I yeah. gotta watch it, man. I got a whole brand after the skinny bag thing. I can't get fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not because I mean, you know, you're gonna have to change the whole name, the I'm, logos, every well, the yeah, the whole channel. You, you're not, you're not actually in the logo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the whole community is gonna have to change over. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is from uh, Walter from Safety Harbor. He wants to to know if you recommend Quick Clot. I do. Okay. Um, so there's two. It's a hemostatic agent, means meaning. Basically, that it takes the blood, it takes the water out of the blood, it makes it thicker. So for these major life-threatening bleeds, it, it helps the bleeding stop faster. So there's two major players in that market right now, and it's called there's Quick Clot, who uh, is made by Z Medica here in the U.S., and then there's Celox, which is uh, made by Biostat over the, in the U.K. And Quick Clot works well. I've used it, um, and it worked fantastically in the field. Uh, and, you know, and then Celox. Uh, Celox says theirs works better for patients who may be on blood thinners, things like that, because it uses the, their natural uh, body's uh, way to stop the bleeding. So Celox says their works better on patients who may be on blood thinners, things like that. Um, I've used Celox and it worked fantastically. So for someone to have that in a trauma kit, if you can afford it, now it's expensive. You know, you can oh. buy compressed galls for four or five dollars, and that's you get a lot of galls in there. Um, so you said clot, the one that's made in over in Europe is more expensive, right? Both of them are pretty expensive. Oh, they and, are okay. Yeah, both of those retail about forty-five dollars a pack. Oh wow! And okay. they're going to expire in five years. Uh, you know, they may okay. not be as effective in five years. So um, okay, it's it's expensive. You can afford it, and it's in your budget, absolutely. But if you can't, just get some compressed galls, you know, for you know a few dollars, and and use that. Yeah. So Jim Lewis, who's now with this comment, sounding like my mom. <laughs> says um, Vicks Vapor Rub under your nose works great. I guess he's talking about the sympathetic puking. <laughs> yes, and it works good for dead bodies. Um, if you've oh, okay. never smelled, if you've never smelled a dead body, you'll never forget the smell. Yeah. Um, and so, kind of putting that up under your nose to stop the the that smell of a body is because mm -hmm. it it's gonna get in your hair, it gets in your clothes. But that's a if you've never smelled it, that's a smell you never forget. Yeah. So there you go, Jim Lewis. Uh, that's a good. That's another use for Vicks vapor rub. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which is good. So, um, and then also, I think Boss Hog wants me to ask you about New Skin. Uh, uh, like, do you know this product called New Skin? Is he talking about the blister, like the, for blisters? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Give us, uh, Boss Hog. Give us a clarification on that one. Um, Go back and look. Um, the you chat, know, but yeah, yeah I, we, can, we can look that I'm up. I'm thinking yeah. it basically it's for like blisters, things like that. Um, you know, you can use it, and it it's going to put the skin, uh, stop the blister from breaking open for you, because that's going to lead to infection and 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 not very good in the long term. Right, absolutely, and um, and then I think you touched on this a little bit. I'm getting to I'm getting to uh, questions that people have out there. Um, is there a CPR that does not require mouth? to mouth, so I think you were saying chest compressions? Yeah, hands-only CPR is honestly what I teach a lot of people. When we go to churches, we go to office buildings, you know, things like that, we, we teach hands-only. So people are scared to do mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. They, they don't want to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth. so they end up not doing anything at all, and that's not helpful. So if we can teach someone just to put hands on the center of their chest and mm -hmm. push down a few inches and do that about 120 times a minute, 
then they'll do it. The, 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 they're willing to do that part. Yeah, they'll and I think the new them. thing, uh, what is the what is the um, thing that you're supposed to use to count now? Is it like staying alive or something? Yep, staying alive. Um, uh, another one bites the dust. Uh, just don't sing that one out loud. <laughs> <laughs> they just kind of look at you yeah. if you're like singing no, that one. No, why did you even tell me that one? Because <laughs> now that's going to be in my head and I'm going to at least hum it out loud. Yeah, another one bites the dust. Like that's the only part I know of that song is the chorus there. So yeah. And another one. <laughs> and another one. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you should have never told me that. <laughs> I was just good with staying alive. Okay, um, yeah, I think that they're saying um, that the new skin is something related to uh, blisters. Yes. So okay. it's, um, I believe I know, it's because blisters can happen from, you know, like hiking or moving, things like that. And, um, you know, we don't want to pop them if we don't have to because if you pop the blister, it's going to lead to infection or can lead to infection. And that, that can leave more problems down the road. So trying to keep anything we can do to keep the blister intact is, is, is going to be helpful for us. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then this is a little bit unrelated to this, but uh, I've gotten several questions. What is your EDC gun? Um. So I know I'm gonna I'm gonna catch crap for this right now. Um. I'm carrying the Springfield XDS, and I know that I'm gonna catch crap for that because of what happened at right the NRA. Yeah. But but how long ago did you get it? You probably had it for a while, right? I've had that gun for a while. Yeah. Um, so you're good, man. It's you know. You can't, good. You can't, yeah. So, they can't hate on you for that. <laughs> Plus, at this point, like we should just. I'm not. I know there's people out there who haven't let it go. I'm probably yep. not gonna buy anything from from. Uh, Springfield at this point, but if you've had it, I don't think there's anything wrong. No, and um, I, my Glock 19. Um, so those are two I switched back and forth to. If I if I'm wearing something that I can conceal my Glock 19, I'm gonna carry that. If I'm wearing something that I can't conceal a little bit better, then I'll go to XDS. Um, right, absolutely. So my wife likes the 43. She's got the Glock 43 right there. So right, I was gonna say yeah, you did mention you because I I carry the Glock 43 a lot. Your wife likes that. She does. She loves it. So that, yeah. that was actually her carry gun. I was stealing it for a long time and she mm -hmm. made me buy something else. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which I was like, okay, you're going to make me buy another gun. I guess I'll go buy another gun. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to twist my arm, <laughs> why not? <laughs> you know, um, and listen, nowadays there's so many deals out there, you might as well. Yeah, I mean, even like, the, it, like um, I've got the M&P Shield. And, yeah. you know, Lola has the Shield. Lola loves the Shield. I've got that shield. I haven't, uh, but you know, that MP shield, uh, Palmetto State Armory was pretty much giving that thing away just for, you know, a little while ago. It was like, was it $250, $200? Somebody? I don't remember. Don't quote really? that. It okay. was dirt cheap. Palmetto State Armory was almost giving that gun away. Oh, wow. Okay. I wonder why that is, man. Just, well, Palme it's Palmetto State Armory's always got some deals like that. It they probably kill was me with the deals. <laughs> yeah. And I would recommend people get that. That is a good. That is a good gun. Lola carries it. She loves that. You know, um, I've used it as well. I just like I think between the the two of us, I prefer the forty three, and she prefers the shield. But they're both. Uh, they're I like both, both good guns. I mean, yeah, I do. You know, <laughs> um, my next gun probably is going to be the Glock twenty six, just because I can use now use my my nineteen mags, my seventeen mags. Yeah. Things like that. Um, for, that'll probably be the next EDC uh, pistol I buy, unless something else comes down the market uh, pretty quick. But yeah, yeah and then you, and then you're gonna have to get a Glock 17 because you know that's good for training. I've Although I, I, I train with my 19. Yeah, <laughs> I have like you know every single. Yep, I have Glock. a 17. Um, that's using that's my truck gun. Um, mm -hmm. That way I can keep extra magazines. Like there's, I, I have the SOE uh, visor in my truck, so there's mm -hmm. an extra magazine there. Um, and then my 17 stays in my bag and then I have a few extra magazines in my side satchel that way something bad happens I can I can get home. Yeah, and you've probably got because uh, you know I, I mean I'm not up on all the videos I'm assuming you have uh, vehicle videos too, right? I do like yep. ADC and the vehicle videos which are which are you know you guys should definitely check those out um, Let me see what else is coming in here um, Okay, so I guess along the line, since we're talking about gun stuff right now, <laughs> we're in the gun thing. What critical defense ammo do you use? Do you really like monitor what you're using there? I don't. I'm gonna be honest yeah. with you. I don't. Yeah, I don't either. I, I, people ask me that, but so I don't know how you go about this. I usually will go buy. Um, I'll, I'll if when I need to, I'll go buy some, but I'll buy more than one box. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Buy several boxes and then I'll run it through whatever guns it's going to go into to make sure it's actually functioning. I do. Those I mean, like I, I shoot a lot of federal stuff right now, um, mm -hmm. so I like that. But I, I'm not. I don't get hung up on it. Maybe I'm I'm wrong. But I don't. I don't get hung up on my defense round. Like as long as. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like I will buy several boxes and actually shoot, um, you know, one or two boxes through whatever gun I'm going to use just to make sure that it's actually functioning because some 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 defensive ammo does not work properly in some guns, right? Right. And I have switched. Most of my stuff is nine millimeter now, um, so I kind of kind of moved that nine millimeter caliber. So I kind of yeah. uh, got away from. I was a forty. I carried a lot of forty five stuff for a while, uh, and then when ammo prices went through the roof several years ago. Mm-hmm. Kind of, kind of went to that nine millimeter. So that's why you know, the seventeen, the shield, the XDS, the forty three, all that kind of center around the nine millimeter. That way, if I want to go buy a thousand rounds of nine, then I can shoot a lot of different guns out of that. Yeah, exactly. So that's you know we're we're pretty much in the same uh, category with how we go down that. Okay, so here's another question from an EMS standpoint: What defensive ammo is the worst gun shot wound? So I don't know if you. Have you seen enough gunshot wounds to make a call on that one? It's more about placement. I mean, I, okay. I, I, it's about where they get shot. At. I've had guys get shot in the stomach with forty fives that were fine, and mm-hmm. you know, you somebody get shot center mass with a nine millimeter and they're dead on the ground. So, um, mm-hmm. it's it's all about shot placement, and that's where we talked about the training, things like that. Uh, is important if you're going to use to defend yourself. That training is super important because when your heart rate's one hundred and fifty. You've got to make sure you can get the shot, shot placements on target uh, to get center mass, to get the headshots in. If you're using it to defend yourself, shot placement is everything. Yeah. And your fine motor skills go to crap when you're under stress. I mean, you, yeah. you understand. You know that. And so, yeah, you need to train to the point that you're not thinking about it and you're not even aiming. But, yep. you, but, you're, good, but you're still getting good shot placement, which is not as difficult as it sounds. Um, you know, you just need to do it. And one of the things too, like I shoot a lot on steel. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember when I first started shooting people like, you know, you've got to make sure that you shoot enough on paper. And because paper is going to help you to know whether or not you're getting good shot placement, right? Yeah. So I love shooting steel. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, it's, it's, steel is just so much fun because you it's get instant that. instant gratification bad. or instant yeah. letdown. Like when you shoot, like we, we shoot a lot of 300 yards uh, at work with Such. And you're like, boom. And you're like, I was like, oh, yes, I got it. Or you yeah. shoot a boom, you're like, uh-oh, the, I missed is it. There, is there a better sound? I don't know. <laughs> that is awesome. So, yeah, just yeah. that, especially long range for the steel target, you, you hear the gun go off, you're like, you're waiting for the steel, like, boom, there it is. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the thing to do is um, definitely when you, if you go training, um, you know, anywhere that actually trains people, they're going to probably use paper but for, you know on your own you should also do some shooting on paper have those uh silhouette you know uh human size um target silhouette targets and just train center mass and where you're not thinking about it you know and if you can get somewhere that lets you move around to get your heart rate up you know that's what we you know and even in class when we do it you know while you're putting a tourniquet on go do you know run 100 yards or run 20 yards or do 10 push-ups and then try to put a tourniquet on, you know, same thing with your firearm. If you're where you can do it, then do 10 push-ups and then get up and try to shoot center mass and see how, how much of a, your circle expands now on your, on your shooting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then I think there's a discussion going on with uh, super glue. So do you think that's a good idea for closing uh, wounds and cuts, et cetera? I do actually for small wounds, like, like cuts on your hand, Little small nicks. Super glue actually works really well. Uh, just if you're gonna do it, use a brand new bottle, because the moment you open up the super glue and you break the seal on top, it starts building up bacteria, and that can be bad. So uh, uh, okay. if you're gonna do super glue, just use a brand new bottle, and it's really good for like smaller cuts, things like that. If it gets larger cuts, I like like the um, butterfly bandages, things like that for for larger wounds to keep them closed. Okay, so yeah, so um, maybe get the little tiny bottles when you use it, throw it away because you're saying if you try to reuse that, once you open it, it could start building up uh, bacteria and then you're going to reintroduce that to your body? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and then super glue is cheap. So just keep it in your car, keep it in your workshop, wherever you, or your house. And then once you use it, then, you know, use yeah. it for other things. Use it for like, super glue, what it's actually intended for. So you don't have to throw it away. Just use super glue what it was actually intended for from that point. 
Right. So is it just super glue or can we go to other brands and things like that? What about Gorilla Glue? <laughs> I have not tried Gorilla Glue. I'm not sure about that. Okay, I need you to do a test, man. Make a video. <laughs> so I'll come down to Florida, I'll cut you and no, we'll try. no, not me. Lola. Lola. You can cut Lola if you want. Oh there would be people who would hurt me if I cut Lola. Yeah, I volunteer Lola. <laughs> no. no, I was just curious because you know, you see that I don't know if there is an actual like it. it you know, we should look into Gorilla Glue. Is it that much different from Super Glue? That's a good question. I'm not but sure. Probably I mean, folks use, out there know. They use glue like that in the emergency room setting, but it's like sterilized and it's, it's supposed to be medical grade glue, things like that. But the Super Glue absolutely works fine. Okay, very cool. All right, so let's. Um, I'm gonna. I want to just touch on a story that you brought up. Um, I guess this was. I want to see where where is this uh, police gunfight that you were talking about? Um, was it in Nevada? I'm trying to see. Yes, Las Vegas. So if you guys, this is the um, headline here. This is from uh, Blue Lives Matter. Video, police with gunfight, uh, police win gunfight, turn suspect into human faucet, then stop leak with tourniquet. <laughs> That's so, patient care right there. That's <laughs> Yeah, so I think North Las Vegas, Nevada, which I think, I, you know, I think, um, I wonder if this is where, like, Mixflip, uh, this is his... If this is, um, you know, his neck of the woods. Okay, two Metropolitan Police Department officers won a gunfight with a suspect and then saved his life with a tourniquet just moments later. And it was all captured on video. Occurred around 5 p.m. Monday when um, they were doing an investigative follow-up to a bicyclist who was shot by somebody in a stolen Honda. The two office officers spotted the stolen Honda and um, I guess when they approached it, it like turned into, you know, a whole thing. The guy was shooting at them. They shot him up, you know, and then saved him. So that's, uh, you know, and that's good, right? Those are, you know, we're, we always talk about, um, you know, when something really goes bad here and someone gets killed and, and definitely someone who didn't, who we feel didn't deserve to die, you know, there's we always, I mean, there's families that, you know, no yeah. matter, anytime there's a shooting like that, there's, it's bad because there's always families involved. You know, you have the suspect's family who didn't do anything wrong, and now they have to suffer the consequences of a loss. And then the police officer has issues, you know. So um, it's just bad all the way around anytime there's an officer yeah. involved shooting, whether it was justified or unjustified. And you know, there's been plenty of cases here recently, it seems like there's unjustified shootings, and those officers should suffer too, you know, just like uh, if I did an unjustified shooting. But there's times, obviously, where an officer has to, has to make that split second decision to take someone's yeah. life. Yeah, and if and if something's gonna go wrong, this is probably if something's gonna go wrong and they have to defend themselves, this is probably, you know, I, I hate to say this, but the best way for it to come out because they defended themselves, they shot him up, and then they saved him. Yep. You know, as opposed to just letting him bleed out, which we have seen, we have seen that a couple of times where they just let the guys die. You yeah, know, either they don't they don't do anything. They wait for paramedics or whatever to get here. But, you know, I'm always telling people that police officers need more training, you know. Um, but these these guys seem to, have, in my opinion, just from reading everything here. Hey, they did what they needed to do. Yeah, they did a jam up job. It sounds like yeah. when I read the article, they stopped the threat, which is important uh, to stop the threat. And then they fixed it. You know, so this yeah. guy would stay in trial and. If yeah, fortunately for him, he's going to survive, you know. <laughs> now, uh, unfortunately for, um, you know, for North North Las Vegas there, they may have to pay this guy some money. Yeah. yeah I'm sure there's going to be lawsuits and all that kind of stuff coming behind it, you know. And I've always thought about that, like, for myself. Like, if I had to use my firearm to mm -hmm. defend myself or defend my family, you know, if I sh you know, have to shoot someone, then, you know, would I try to take care of them? Like, I don't that's something you have to think about. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I, I would like to think I would, you know, see a human being laying there now and I would, you know, try to mm -hmm. do something. So, but there again, the guy may have been just pointing a gun at my wife and I may, I don't know. So yeah. That's yeah, situation. yeah. I mean, that's a, a real coming to God moment. I think where, you know, you, you find out what kind of human being you are, Yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> And I don't mean that that that's like a good thing or a bad thing. I think it really does depend on that situation. No, and I hope because <laughs> you know, there's some I've people never... we don't really want in this world. You know, if yeah. you decide to go after people, especially on their property and their family members and all that kind of stuff, put them in danger. You know, 
yeah, it gets it gets crazy. But no matter what, like you said before, there's like no good things that happen through this, the, except for the fact that you survive, right? Yeah. Which is important. It, yeah. Yeah, but everything after that is horrible. <laughs> so yeah. um, I see the logical issues. There's there's a whole bunch of mess that comes with that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Now I see that guys are talking about duct tape. So I guess you know while we're on the subject of uh, different like everyday common household things that we can use, what do you think about duct tape? So duct tape will fix anything, especially here in South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, duct tape. I did a video. Um, God, it's probably been a while back now, maybe a year or two ago, on duct tape, like how to make a hey, how to make a butterfly bandage out of duct tape. Um, you, know, you can make a you can wrap duct tape tight enough, you can make a tourniquet out of it. So you can make if you yeah. wrap it, just keep wrapping because you're making it so much wider. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make a tourniquet out of it, make pressure bandage out of it. You can tape on a plastic bag to your chest, make a chest seal out of it. Okay, so, so the way to go with the duct tape is just keep wrapping it over, right? Keep wrapping. Instead, of, trying to make instead of trying to twist, like, do that pressure thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. if you've got duct tape, that. I would mm -hmm. just keep pulling it tight. And as you come around the arm or the leg, if you pull it tight as you can and then wrap it around, that's what I would recommend you do. And just make it as wide as possible. And you try to put some, maybe like a T-shirt on the wound so you can duct tape the T-shirt to the wound. I'll look at oh, that way. Okay. Okay. Cool. Now, all of this brings up in my mind. I don't know if that. Well, first of all, are there any other common household things that are that are good that that serve these dual purposes or multi purposes? What about that? Uh, what's the what's that stuff I see in the infomercials that like you know the guy has a a hole in his boat and then he puts the stuff on there and then they take a bunch of it and they spray it on a um, on like a a door makes it waterproof. Yeah, they, they spray it on like one of the doors that have the has the uh, mosquito netting or whatever, or uh, you know, and yeah, it makes it water. What is that stuff? I, I can't I can't remember the name. Oh, Flex Seal, Flex Seal. Yeah, that's yeah. It. So, so what about Flex Seal? I don't really know about that. Have you tried that one? I have not know? tried that one yet. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to do a video and see <laughs> what we can do with Flex Seal. Yeah, when well, you yeah. come down, I'll get Walter Keller, and he can be he's a great. We can volunteer him to be our victim. All right, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, we can cut him up, do all you know. He'll be fine. Yeah, he'll be he'll be okay with it. He'll survive. I'm not sure he I'm not sure he'll bleed. <laughs> oh gosh. No, no, I'm just messing with him since he's there. But are are there any other things, household things? Yeah, I mean, like you know, we we talked about using even like a paper towel roll. Um, uh, using a paper towel roll to you know, use that to help control bleeding because that's going to absorb a lot of blood. You know, mm -hmm. holding that good firm direct pressure. Uh, a Ziploc bag for making a chest seal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can use you know an ace bandage uh, to make an, a, a, an impromptu Israeli bandage. Um, okay, toilet paper is that as good as a paper towel roll or not? I'd probably try to do a paper towel roll like that. Okay, over like, toilet paper. I'm digging through the pantry trying to find first aid items. Okay. Okay. Cool. And I think, and I know you've done this. Not think. I know that you've done this. Um, scissors. That's probably good. I don't think we spoke about that. What kind of scissors should we have in this bag? Or do we even really need scissors or anything like that? Yeah, I think scissors are important. Now, I don't like the like your household scissors because they have a point to them. So if you're trying to cut someone's clothes or trying to like, remove their shirt, you don't want to stab them in the arm with a uh, you know a pair of scissors. You're just creating more wounds. Yeah. But you can find like the EMT shears at Lowe's, Walmart, you know, Amazon. I sell them, and they have a, a – curve to the front of them so when you cut they don't they don't pinch you um, a lot of things you're seeing now start to come out is like the bench made hooks and i like those a lot because they're really low profile and they just have a hook like a fancy seat belt cutter on them mm -hmm. and you can pull down and they'll just completely cut the shirt off super fast okay and so they're made by bench made and they have a lifetime warranty so i like those right um, so yeah, I mean that's and and it's the same thing with knives, right? Like probably just like it's not good to use regular scissors. Probably not a good idea to go in there with uh with your with your like EDC knife and try. Yeah, to you're cut stuff. you're stabbing some guy in the leg as you're trying to pull. Yeah. Stuff, so <laughs> probably not the best idea that I do either. But you know, no. the, you know the Benchmade stuff runs about thirty five dollars. A, a good pair of like EMT shears or medical shears are probably like five five bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so love. something like that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, all right. So here's a question. Uh, what? Okay. So actually, Tyvin Show wants to know if you recommend smelling salts. That's another common household thing. 
It is, yeah. I mean, you can do that, that kind of uh, ammonia inhalants work for like bringing people that are, are unconscious or you think they're unconscious, things like that to help mm -hmm. wake them back up. Yeah. Um, is honey actually any good? I think I saw that somewhere. I don't know if that's yeah. like... So that's... raw honey, like natural honey, is good for wounds, like burns, cuts, things like that, because it's a natural antibiotic. Okay. Um, so as long as it hasn't been refined, like, the, like if you're going to do that, go and get like good honey. Go to your farmer's market, uh, farm supply store, and you get some good like local honey. Okay, organic stuff. Yes, and okay. put, it in your, put it in your coffee, put it in your tea. Um, it actually works really good for allergies too. So if you buy honey that's in your area, th those bees have been pollinating on the flowers that are making you sneeze. So if you buy local honey, then you drink that. It'll actually help you with the allergies and sinuses too. Yeah, absolutely. Also good for like sore throats and uh, if you have a cold, all that kind of stuff. Yep. That's you where know. Jack Daniels comes in too. We were talking yeah. About. yeah, honey, <laughs> Jack, honey Daniels. And Jack Daniels. You're good. <laughs> those two things in the kit must have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, I remember my grandmother used to make me drink rock and rye when I would have a sore throat. I'm like, that stuff was awful. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're gonna do it. Drink some good stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what it actually was, but we used to have something called like bitters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. If you have, yeah, my mother used to make us drink that stuff. <laughs> it was so disgusting. Like yeah. chest just burns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. I'm glad those days are over. Uh, you know. So people are asking. I think you were talking a little bit about being a prepper. What kind of prepper are you, and uh, what do you prep for? So yes, we are. I, I, I'm a, I guess you could say I'm a prepper. Um, we're not a doomsday prepper. I don't have a bunker around the backyard, but we just want to be prepped for you know an emergency situation. You know, we we have uh, probably six months worth of food on hand just in case. Um, we have water. I have uh, two areas. We have gardens. We have fresh food uh, and vegetables. We have chickens out in their backyard. So, you know, we meet all walks of life for preppers, people who think the world's going to come to an end and they have years worth of food on hand and no problem with that. Um, but, you know, we also meet people that are, you know, sensible about it. You know, they have, you know, a little bit of food on hand, have a little bit of water, have some medical supplies on hand. That way, if something bad happens, um, you know, it's there. You know, for mm -hmm. you guys down in Florida, if you have a hurricane that comes up, um, you know, you may be several days a week without power. So having a backup generator to think about, having um, extra food on hand, fresh water, you know, for you yeah. guys is going to be an issue. So, um, the, you know, when I say people, tell people I'm a prepper, they get, usually gets this, like, this, they think of I'm like in my underground bunker right now. And that, yeah. not, not that there's about. anything wrong with that. You are amongst gun guys, so there's I want an underground bunker. Thank you. Yeah, very like much. if you can afford <laughs> an underground bunker and you want to do that, go Dude. right ahead. But um, and yeah. like I said, I I know guys who are doing it, and um, it's fine, you know. But you, being sensible about it and and making it part of your lifestyle, like we you know we have canned food that we rotate through, and we do have the dehydrated food that we rotate through. But you know it's part of our lifestyle. Like we want fresh vegetables for us and our kids. So we have that out there. We have the chickens for fresh eggs. We have eggs coming out of our ears right now. So, uh -huh. um, you know, just it's, it's about a quality of life too. You know, we want the fresh food because there's so much stuff, crap going into our food. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times you see the recall on certain food because they find crap in it and we don't, mm -hmm. we don't want that. So. Yeah. And you know, like when it comes to prepping, I mean, I always tell people, yeah, there's the big macro emergencies that happen to everyone, including you possibly. But then there's the, uh, you know, there's the micro emergencies that just happen to you, people in your family, you know, maybe your spouse when it comes to like income or something like that and prepare for those things where maybe you have to go for two weeks or a month or a few months where mm -hmm. you're not making as much money and all that. And, and so therefore, you can't go out to eat out for dinner every night and all that. You know, that's why we, yeah. we, you know, doing our business full time, we rely on sales. We rely on that business. So if sales drop off, then, you know, we can't, we, we have to rely on that stuff. So that's why we have our food stock and things like that. Um, yeah. You know, I was in Florida last year when the hurricane came up and, you know, people were just rushing to the store to get fresh water. They were filling up the cars for gasoline and they were in full panic mode because of a hurricane coming up. And, you know, in my truck, I had a case full of water just in case, you know, just a yeah. way to get home and just thinking more along those lines of, you know, what do I need to get home if something bad happens? Yeah, uh, you that's, know. you know, that whole thing, I think, is just a psychological thing that happens to people that they hear something's coming and then they go to Home Depot, they go to super, and they just buy everything. 
it's like, it's like here, oh, let me just grab this stuff right now. Yeah, and here, like, it's like if we get like a little bit of ice, people go to the store and they buy milk and bread. And I'm like, why do you, what are you going to do with the milk and bread? Like your power is going to go out. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and just having that prepared mindset, you know, that hopefully nothing ever bad happens and we don't lose electricity for a year or, you know, Russia doesn't take us over. Um, you know, nothing bad ever happens, but, you know, just being more prepared for a winter weather emergencies is, you know, a tornado coming through. Yeah. That's where you need to start thinking about things, you know, having a generator on hand, having to look at solar power, things like that. And then yeah. if something bad happens, you know, the financial collapse or you lose your job or you know, you're, you're prepared, you're ready to go for your family. Yeah, absolutely. And then things like that go on, you know, um, first fill up water and stuff like that. Fill up water bottles. The biggest thing you'll, you'll need to do most immediately is to like wash your hands, you know, take a bath with, uh, with that water, maybe drink the water and stuff like that. You know, the most immediate thing, flush the toilets. <laughs> yeah. Have a good water filter. You know, that's one yeah. thing you see all these bull water advisories come out. So having a good water filter that you can filter some of the bad stuff out so you don't get sick from that uh, it is important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. That's that's pretty good. Um, you know, let's go through here. I don't know if there's um, – let's hit up some news, man. Let's hit some, like, uh, popular topics. So um, I guess Reince Priebus is out as the chief of staff. <laughs> There's some like serious shakeups going on. Do you talk about politics, man? Are you, you know, political I, dude? I am, but I, I honestly, I don't, I don't get on my website. I don't, I don't do it on my um, yeah. YouTube channels because I, I have a little bit of everybody who watch, and I try to, I just want to be a nice guy. I don't want to like piss people off. So. Oh really? Oh okay. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, we'll do it. Um, you know, I know like one of the big things we're looking at right now is this Affordable Care Act. You know, they're trying mm-hmm. to repeal it, and they, and they, they didn't get the votes for it today. Yeah. And you know, I, so I see. What, what do you think about that being in the medical field? Do you think that Obamacare has been good? Do you think we need a replacement? What do you think? Obamacare is not perfect. I mean, it did provide people health care insurance. And personally, I feel like I work really hard for my health care insurance. You know, and I, I, I earn it. I, I think health care probably should be, it, it, it's a privilege, you know, to do it. And, but I see people that are abusing that as well people that abuse the emergency department you know they're going to the emergency room for sore throats and i'm like that's not what the emergency yeah. room's for so there's abuse of the healthcare system and i think now that's, that's what that's fix yeah i mean but that's been going on for a long time right so i mean that goes way back that people what does that go back to the 70s and yeah, i mean it's going for a long time and yeah i feel like that you know i don't think the government should force me to to get health care you know if i don't want to provide health care i want to pay out of pocket for my medical problems, I should be able to do that. And yeah, uh, that's one of the big problems I had with Obamacare is the fact that you were going to force me to have medical insurance. And I'm like, what if I don't want it? You know, what if I, I want to pay out of pocket for things? And we have found uh, honestly that if we go to our doctor and say, Hey, you know, we're going to pay out of pocket for this, you know, they're willing to talk to us for that kind of stuff. Yeah. I've, I've heard that from a lot of people. And then on the flip side, like if you, um, if you have some medical issues, like I have Crohn's, and um, if you've got medical issues and you feel like, hey, listen, I want to have what they call a Cadillac plan, you know, you want to put a little bit more extra money into that, into your uh, medical plan so that you have, uh, you know, more benefits or whatever, you know, I found that Obamacare totally destroyed that. You know, all those things completely went away and uh, we just lost ch- options and choices and things like that. We did. You and know. so and now you see a lot of healthcare insurances are pulling out of their certain states because mm-hmm. there's no the market's not there. So they're you're you're losing your choices of, of healthcare insurance where before you had options that you could go to, you know, if you just want to pay a little bit of money a month to have a catastrophic plan, you could do that. Um, but now you're you're really limited on your choices. So I I see both sides of it, but you look at like how the national like they just like our political system is screwed up all together, all the way around. And mm-hmm. they on can't both run, sides, the, the fact that we sides, have a, like, a two party system is really screwed up. They can't run themselves. And why do we expect them to run our healthcare insurance or our healthcare program? Like that's, that's the frustrating part. So I would be more in favor of like private companies doing it, things like that, you know, private, you know, that free market going through. 
Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems we have with this thing is that it's being approached politically, obviously, right? Every Because it's a, such a touch-button but, subject, because it's so important to all of us, you know, uh, it's everyone's dealing with this uh, from a political point of view, and therefore, we're stuck. <laughs> you know, we're not going to get it fixed. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, they need to realize that this has nothing to do with politics as human beings, and we need the best care that we can have, but trying to make it something socialized, something, you know, where... You know this thing that like it has to be fair for everyone so if you've got money and you could pay for this thing screw you you can't have i mean all of that's just not going to work you yeah. have to have different levels you have to allow people who say i don't want it to not have it yeah you and know if they want to pay out of pocket for something then they they're going to do it so yeah absolutely and you want to allow doctors to be able to do all that stuff you know and at the same time on the flip side of that if people do want to have this you know big expensive thing you want that most of what they need to do is just get the hell out of the way because it's one of these things that um, when they stifle competition like this by by coming in, it just gets worse and worse. You know, Lola, I worked for a long time in the uh, in in the medical field. I worked in hospitals and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, um, I'm not a very smart guy, so I wasn't actually like in medicine. I was just doing a bunch of other things there. And uh, Lola, but Lola is actually in the medical field. She's a pharmacist, and um, yeah, I, I can tell so you. There's so much prop like that's that's another thing. You know, these these medicines are just outrageous. Yeah. Um, look what they did to EpiPen. You know, a couple of years ago or last year, the cost of EpiPen went through the roof. Yeah, the isn't guy that could've. guy? Isn't that guy still on trial? I think? Yeah, he's getting yeah. trouble for that, by the way. So he's getting nailed for that. But you know, an EpiPen that went through the roof because he could. And mm -hmm. that that was wrong. And you know, I I see both. I I, I can see both sides of you know. I have no problem if someone's, you know, they're in between jobs or in a down situation, you know, help them out for a short amount of time. And then like, all right, you got to get a job. You got to work. You know, you don't it's enough of the hand handouts. And that's what frustrates me. Yeah. And, and even that whole thing, there's a balance to the argument that, hey, maybe they should be able to set this price. But at the same time, if there's a lot of people using it and they've kind of cornered the market, um, you know, what can be done about that? I know there's generics. Mm -hmm. Things like that, that out there, but a lot of these companies come up with all kinds of tricks. Lola and I are always talking about it, where they just add some kind of inert thing to something, and then it's like, boom, they get it for another twenty years. Or yep, and then whatever. there's nobody like the EpiPen. Like, there's nobody. He's got the market on that. Nobody can come up and with another type of EpiPen to 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 be a competitor for it because he has yeah. the patent for it right now. And until so that drops, nobody's gonna do anything about it. Yeah, see, here's the thing that I worry about. I don't think that healthcare was perfect before Obamacare came in, but I think that we would be better off if we go back to that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Obamacare is a lot worse, and um, even, like I said, Lola works for a hospital and all that kind of stuff, and the benefits that we have under her coverage have gotten progressively worse. You know, as someone, like I said, that I have a chronic disease, Crohn's, I see it. I deal with this all the time. It's it's re totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We we need to almost just like go back at this point, if that's possible. I don't know that it's possible to do that, but definitely Obamacare is not a solution to that. And then I think the reason why we're having all these problems right now, it's not that um, you know the the Republican uh, holdouts are necessarily wrong either, because they you know being on the inside, they may see that hey, this isn't going to be that much different from Obamacare. And maybe yeah. they want to actually fix something, but somehow we've got to like get away from the politics part of this because we're going to make this worse. That's the frustrating part is the fact that they can't get along up there. You know, they are, they are split along party lines and nothing's going to get accomplished. And it's just, it's like, it's just frustrating. But this is one of those issues that shouldn't go this way, right? I mean, maybe we should have some things in America that when things like this come up, they just go to the people. Yeah. You know, and and they ask us, what do you guys want? You want us to fix this thing? You know, we come up with it and then, OK, the majority of people want to do this. And maybe we just go with that and, and somehow get out of the quagmire because it's just going to go like now the political strategies are let's block the hell out of this thing mm -hmm. on, until, you know, we get into power. Then we'll block the hell out of it. Now, sometimes that works to our advantage as gun guys. Right. Yeah. That's what we're hoping, you know, I mean, because I guarantee you there's none of us looking at Trump and not thinking, well, he's at least a little bit crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he's, 
uh, yeah, I mean, he's out there too. Like, there's no, he's obviously he was better than the other candidate we had a choice with, but I'm like, yeah. he's out there too. Like he's, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, obviously I like to, he put in the Supreme court and that's the reason why. Yeah. I, I and that's to, incredibly important to us as gun guys. Yeah. I need somebody conservative in the Supreme court. That's going to affect what happens years down the road. But I'm like, man, he's going to get us in trouble. Like he's going to, he's gonna, like, just get off Twitter for a few minutes. Like, you know, but it would go back to the healthcare thing too. You know, when I was coming out of high school, um, you know, I, I wasn't in school full time and my parents tried to get healthcare insurance for me and I, they couldn't because I was underweight um, and healthcare insurance oh, wow. would not insure me because I was a cross country runner. I would run 10 miles a day um, and not even think about it. So I ran a lot. So I probably weighed 110 pounds. Was I healthy? No, but you were I was just addicted to the burn. I was addicted to it. And yeah, when the, they, I would see those guys. Out, they would figure out how much I weighed and they're like, Oh, he, he, he can't be insured. But I'm like, you got these guys that are 300 pounds that have insurance. Yeah. And so that was the frustrating and you were part. Probably like the fittest dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, at that point in time, I came out of high school, um, you know, running 10 miles a day, easy. And, you know, my heart rate was probably 50 sitting here normal. So, I mean, I was probably the healthiest person, but could not get healthcare insurance. So did I need it? Probably not, but what if you know something, you know, a car accident or something like that would have happened? So, um, you know, it's just all around, it's screwed up. There's no, and there's no easy fix either. Like you just can't. I don't know. There's no easy fix. Yeah, I don't think there is. And and um, at some point though, they have to get together. But I just don't think. Uh, I think that what the you know. I think we're going to have to burn down politics in America. It's going to crash. Yeah. Um, and that goes back to the prepping thing. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, uh, the financial collapse is a very real opportunity that I think can happen Yeah, and it, it can't sustain itself. You know, yeah. you know, you, this Obamacare, it, sound, it looks good on paper, sounds good maybe, but it just, it cannot support itself financially. And that's where the struggle is going to come in. Yeah. I think that, you know, just so the people don't get it twisted, I'm not, I don't hope for like chaos or, you know, anarchy or anything like that. But I think that what's happening with politicians, man, on both sides is so horrible. And um, just really nothing's, you know, nothing is going to get fixed, the whole system. And I think it's going to just somehow come to like a boiling point and then people are going to get really mad. And this is one of those things that touches everyone. I don't care if you're out there and you're like, oh, I'm super healthy. I'm never going to have. Yeah, well, something's going to happen to you and you're going to have to deal with health care somehow. Yep. And, you know, I, that's why I think term limits. I'm a huge proponent of that. There should not be career, career politicians that make their whole career in the Senate and the House. Like, you should not be able to do that and just. Yeah. I also think they just they shouldn't have good health care. I think we should eliminate whatever the, the way. If, but we don't have any possible way. Of no, I've seen this. the like the memes going on Facebook a lot, like like John McCain. Like, why is he not getting treated at the V.A.? Yeah, a real choice. Because I mean, like, his because his healthcare is fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my dad has. To Why go would to he the go VA. to the VA? Yeah, I mean, you know, the VA is, is a pretty t like if you talk to the guys that have to go there, it's not fun. No, and they have to wait months to get in there. Like if they yeah. have a problem, it takes them forever to get into the VA. So, like, what? Yeah. yeah. I think the solution is like we should somehow be able to force stuff on them. One of the <laughs> things we should be able to force on them is the same health care that we have. Absolutely. I think so. If you're going to vote for it, you should. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if they can't if they can't fix the health care thing, we should probably start by taking away their health care, giving them the options that we have and then see how the hell that is, how that feels. And then yep. maybe they go, yeah, we got to fix this shit. <laughs> absolutely. I agree with that. You know. So that's that's a probably good way to go about it. All right. Listen, we've been doing this for a while. I think we've hit some good stuff. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to wear out our welcome with people out there. Although this has been fun. I know one thing I definitely want to remind everyone out there before we go anywhere. Like you and I are bandmates, man. We're on, we're like <laughs> we're both on full 30 as well as YouTube. Yes, we're on full 30. Um, you know, we're you know, with all the YouTube's AdSense problems right now and you know, we took a hit too. It's funny, you know, that if if I post a video on how to treat a gunshot wound or um, I say, oh my gosh, that's a lot of blood. Then YouTube's voice recognition picks that up and is not considered ad friendly. So we right. took a hit just like you gun guys did with our channel as well. So we're over there um, at full 30 as well. We were uh, graciously invited to go over there and we, we post over there 
um, and we are, we're happy to be over there as well. Yeah, so how are you posting on Full 30 for folks that are out there? Are you posting stuff on Full 30 before you put it on YouTube? Um, how's, you know, so how do you yes, I, I, I post on Full 30 first. So if you, if you want to go to Full30.com and subscribe to my channel there, you're going to see the video uh, a day early, at least a few hours early, you're going to see that video pop up. And I do try to limit my videos over there just to be related to the gun guys, like something that I think is going to be relative to the gun, gu run, gun community. Um, but we, we post a lot of videos over there, so we do post it early so we can watch it. Yeah, um, and, you know, I, um, we, we try to do the same thing. It doesn't exactly work out that way all the time. Sometimes it just because, cannot work out. Yeah, just because of the logistics of it. But we do post stuff. Sometimes we're posting things at the same time or – Sometimes even on full 30 a little bit later or whatever, it just works out on the logistics of how it all works. I think that, you know, it's um, it's not perfect. The, the guys over there are definitely trying to improve it. You know, there's just this conundrum of that, like, YouTube has a monopoly on everything, but it's not exactly friendly for those of us in the gun community. And unfortunately, we don't have our own platform. No, yet. and that's what, I, I mean, I, I love full 30 and they're they're good to me. But it's, it's a limited community as well. So if I'm trying to reach people outside of the gun community, Full 30 is not the place. I have to be over at YouTube. Um, yeah. And so I try to reach people who are not in my community, who are outside the prepping, survival, first aid you know, community, I bring them in. And that's where YouTube is a, is a plus there. Yeah, it's a tough struggle right now. So are there other things that you do for people that want to support you? So, for example, are you on Patreon? We are. We, we did join Patreon, and we've got quite a few people over there that are supporting us. And so I, I'm extremely humbled by that. I think it's amazing the people that are supporting us there. Um, and then we have our website that we sell supplies. And that's our main source that we want to push people to is to buy the kits and buy the gear from us at, at medicalgearoutfitters.com is because then you're getting the right gear. I'm selling you good quality medical supplies. And then you watch my videos, and you're getting good training. So you have a, the mixture of both yeah. worlds. Yeah, I think you guys should definitely uh, reward Dietrich for because it takes it, this. It's not easy. It's not easy to do gun videos. It's not. It's definitely not easy to do the uh, medical videos that you're doing. So I think you know, for you putting up those things and, and and letting people have completely free access to that, right? Exactly, and that's what we talk about. You know, if you go take a first aid class, you can spend you know a, a you know hundred two hundred dollars on a first aid class. You take a two-day trauma class, that's a $500 cost. So my, my videos are completely free. So for someone to give a dollar a month, you know, we appreciate that. And that's what they're, they're paying for. They're paying for that knowledge that you're getting on how to use first aid items. Yeah, I think what you're doing is awesome, man. So Thank I you. encourage people to support you. Your Patreon is just uh, Patreon slash Skinny Medic? It is, yes. Okay, awesome. And then you're on YouTube. He's also on Full30. Um, if you watch us on Full 30, that does help. You know, Full 30 is a little bit better because they accept advertising from the firearms industry. It is. You know, hopefully the firearms industry doesn't burn down anytime soon. <laughs> hopefully not. I, I got two suppressors waiting to come. So I'm, I'm, yeah, the signs aren't good, but we'll see what happens. I think it'll survive. It will yeah. survive. I got two tax stamps waiting. So I'm like, just, I got another year probably before I get those back. So <laughs> Right, absolutely. Okay, so any other links or things you want to uh, point people to? Nope, we're on, we're on all the most major social medias. We're on Instagram. I love Instagram. I uh, post yeah. on a good bit. Uh, we're yeah, on and, Facebook. Ms. and Mrs. Skinny Medic is on Instagram. Yep, I, Mrs. I follow Skinny Mrs. Skinny Medic as well. Yep, if you want to go follow, see what Mrs. Skinny Medic's up to. Uh, you can <laughs> follow her on Instagram. She's always up to something. <laughs> she's always up to something. So <laughs> yeah. She is awesome. She's, she's great. She is. Yeah, man, she does cool stuff. Yeah, you, like you have Lola support. We, but us, man, we've got to have that that woman in the background supporting us. So. Absolutely, yeah, man. That's that's how I survive every day. Believe it. It doesn't always feel like that. There's some days, <laughs> but the truth is, it's you know, <laughs> I would be in big trouble. I would be in huge trouble. Yeah. My you see me as one of those dudes on the side of like the yeah. you know on the on the uh, on the ramp of the highway, like sign. We'll make gun videos <laughs> change. <laughs> Please give me ammo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're joking, but this could happen. <laughs> this could happen. All right. So cool. Follow Skinny Medic. You're on, um, he's on most of the social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Yep. All that good stuff. Okay. So I want to encourage you guys. I want to thank you, man, for coming on. I really appreciate it. You know, thank we've you. been friends for a while. Uh, I've been, yeah. I've been looking forward to it. We've got to make it. I got to make it down to Florida. 
Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you're in Florida, you guys are welcome to come stay with us. And also, man, you know, I like to have you back on here. If some big medical stuff goes down and you're available, you know, we have a panel. It'll be awesome to get you to jump on and give us your knowledge. So it's just not me running my big mouth. Awesome. <laughs> I, I'm up. really excited what you're doing here on your channel. It's it's a uh, it's awesome. Sweet. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dietrich. I appreciate it. Okay. And so before we end here, I want to thank everyone who's there's like tons of comments there. I'm not sure that we got to everyone's stuff. If you have more questions and things like that, uh, either leave it in the uh, comment section of this video or hit up Skinny Medic directly and tell them that we sent you. I want to, uh, you know, thank the guys that support us. So that will be Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, and Safety Harbor Firearms, as well as Big Daddy Guns that gives us the studio and the bandwidth and all that kind of stuff. And especially, especially the folks on Patreon. We're on Patreon slash Hank Strange, and uh, we appreciate and need you guys supporting us there. I'm Hank Strange for Skinny Medic. Peace out, people. Peace.